My name is uh, Lu Nguyen. I'm the uh, program director for the IEEE EPS Society, uh, the Silicon Valley chapter, which covers Santa Clara, uh, San Francisco, and Oakland. And uh, I'm uh, representing the chapter today. Our chapter chair, Annette, uh, just got her two COVID shots, and so she's vacationing in Hawaii. So uh, anyway, we have set up a whole list of uh, talks for the year already. So if you go to our website, you can see that uh, uh, there are roughly two talks per month uh, covering things from uh, heterogeneous integration, printed electronics, the green electronics, power electronics, medical, you know, we have a talk on the reliability of electronics used in robo taxi. So that should be an interesting one to hear also. And of course, uh, quantum computing. Uh, so today is uh, the first of our three talks that uh, we have set up for uh, quantum computing. And uh, so uh, before we start uh, to today, uh, what I wanna show is uh, a couple of items here. You can see that on the, uh, uh, on the folder. Uh, we will have uh, uh, another one uh, that's on uh, 3D packaging for superconducting qubits from Rabinda Das of MIT Lincoln Lab. And uh, uh, he will be talking on May 13th. Uh, the time again is noon Pacific. And uh, the third topic uh, will be on uh, quantum fiber optic interconnect technology for quantum networks. And also this is like a fiber optics uh, with high resolution and uh, people are looking at uh, two things uh, for quantum networks. And uh, the time for that is at 5 p.m. Pacific. And uh, this is to accommodate uh, the speaker who will be uh, joining us uh, from Malaysia. So uh, if you uh, want to learn more about quantum, what I want to show are uh, these uh, two bullets here. Uh, I am on the steering committee of uh, the IEEE Quantum, uh, which essentially is an initiative uh, launched in 2019 by IEEE. And essentially it serves as a leading community for our projects related to quantum. So if you go to you know, the website type uh, quantum you will find out all the information about uh, what uh, we're doing there. And then if you want to uh, learn some of the more basics or maybe even advanced stuff, uh, go to the quantum education workforce uh, development. There's a whole series of programs there uh, that offer courses uh, and seminars that are taught by people in academia, in the national labs and industry uh, talking about uh, quantum topics. What you find out is that there's a lot of things on uh, quantum, but uh, very few things on packaging. So this is what we're trying to change. And then if you are in the Electronic Packaging Society, you know that the flagship conference is the ECTC for IEEE Quantum. It is the IEEE Quantum Week. And uh, if you uh, type in uh, QCE Quantum, uh, you will get the, a whole link of that. And uh, you can see that it is supported by a number of societies. Uh, EPS is one of those supports that. Uh, it's a virtual conference this year, and uh, there are still uh, you know, time to submit papers and posters if you're interested. So this is the flagship uh, conference for uh, Quantum. Last year, they, they had the, uh, over 800 people attending you know, representing like uh, 200 plus companies and, and from like 40 plus uh, countries. And so they expect, you know, maybe more this year uh, since uh, the words are getting out. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's a lot of things on quantum, but uh, not much are published in uh, uh, packaging. So we're trying to change that. And I was working with uh, Avi Bar Cohen, the previous uh, 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 president of EPS. Uh, on this one here, and you can see on the right side there are a list of the topics uh, that uh, essentially relates to packaging from uh, deep cryo, packaging material properties at deep cryo, the form factor use, uh, you know, packaging and partitioning architecture, modeling, things like that. And so there's a lot of things uh, that can be published in that uh, type of thing. So, you know, please take a look at that. And, uh, you know, we're looking for uh, more contribution in the future. So for the first talk on quantum computing uh, for the chapter, uh, we have uh, Professor Michael Hamilton from Auburn. He will talk on, uh, on packaging interconnect technologies for cryogenic and quantum systems. So uh, Michael told me to be brief on this one here. So I'll be brief on this. Uh, you know, he essentially uh, got his PhD in WE from uh, at the University of Michigan, at work at MIT Lincoln Lab, 
And uh, he's, uh, um, he's, besides being a professor at Auburn, he's a director of the Alabama Micro Nanoscience and Technology Center. Uh, so today he will talk about uh, uh, this uh, packaging to connect for cryogenic stuff. So go ahead, Michael. Okay, so so yeah, thanks a lot. I hope everybody's doing, doing uh, very well today. Uh, fun to do all these virtual things. So, um, yeah, as as Lou mentioned, I'm at Auburn University, uh, and um, and I'm I'm the, the uh, a professor here as well as director of of AMNSTC. Uh, so I'll start off with a few intro comments here, some overview and motivation of what we're what we've been working on. So after the intro comments here, I've got a section on our uh, our packaging and integration technology that we've been developing for various cryogenic electronic systems, uh, and then. Uh, since this has kind of a, a, a quantum uh, grouping to it, I, I figured I'd throw in some slides on, on moving towards quantum and how, how our work could relate to that. Uh, and also t discuss some of the challenges that we're aware of from, from the, the packaging and integration side. So AMSDC, AMNSDC is our state funded micro nano fab center here. Uh, so uh, and I'm, I'm a, a lowly professor. Uh, I, I just have a lot of uh, good students here that that uh, that do a lot of work for us on on these topics, and so uh, I've got got them listed here. Several of them are are on on the west coast already. That seems to be where a lot of our students head. So you can see where those folks are, and then several of them are still here uh, back at Auburn, continuing to do some work. And I should also say that a, a lot of this work that I'll show today was uh, was sponsored by Microsoft, and that was in close collaboration with Dr. David Zuckerman as well. So. Uh, so the motivation here, uh, if you haven't seen the inside of a dilution refrigerator before, especially one that's that's packed with uh, with, with quantum processors and things of that nature, uh, it, it's primarily filled with cables, and that's a, a, a growing problem uh, in terms of getting a larger number of cables or interconnects down to down to the, the devices of, of interest, as well as the the thermal loading that those cables put on on the 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 mixing chamber, the lowest temperature stage of the dilution fridge. Uh, and so there's the there's certainly a, a, a quantum aspect to it and a cryogenic aspect to it in terms of the other other potential systems as well. So, for example, uh, on the right here, you see a uh, an imager system set up for a, for a telescope and you can look at all the, the cryo cables that are feeding that. So as, as imagers get larger, as these processors get larger, uh, there's a lot of uh, growing demand for a number of, of high performance interconnects. And these aren't necessarily just DC signals. They're sometimes very, very high frequency microwave signals. Like you might need to drive uh, a, a transmon. Here's an old, uh, older picture of a, of a transmon uh, qubit from the, from the Martinez group. Uh, and you can see all the, all the cryogenic, or all the coaxial cables that go to support that uh, to do calibration and tuning and driving of, as well as readout of, of those. Uh, and to add another little layer of, of quantum aspect to it here, uh, and I, I'll get into some more of the details of, of other quantum aspects later on, but just to kind of uh, kind of preface all of this with work that's ongoing right now that I would assume a lot of you are aware of, but I'll put it out here anyway. So uh, IBM is certainly on a path uh, to, to develop superconducting qubit systems. Here's a picture of one of the inside of their fridges, and you can see the tremendous number of coaxial cables and connectors and attenuators, et cetera, that are inside of that dill fridge. And here's their one of their latest processors. And they have a nice roadmap that shows how they're moving from tens of qubits out to hundreds of qubits here over the next few years. Uh, Google, obviously, uh, over the past year or two, has done some fantastic demonstrations. You can see the, the tremendous number of, of microwave cables, again, in, the, in these systems. I mean, it's... Uh, I hesitate to say it's a nightmare, but anything that can be done to minimize the, the complexity of this and make it easier to connect everything is, is going to help advance things faster. And here's a, a couple of their processors, Bristol Cone and Sycamore. Uh, and then included Intel as well, because uh, not only do they have a superconducting processor, a quantum processor, but they're also bringing in cryogenic electronics closer to that with this Horse Ridge 2 module that brings in some of the control electronics down into the, the cold space as well. Uh, a lot of this, a lot of the, the interconnects that you see for some of these other systems are because all of the control electronics sit outside in these racks. So there's uh, an obvious drive 
the need to drive those electronics down closer to the processors that will be that will be used as well. Uh, so, in a lot of the work that I'll show here, we've, we've been using superconductors uh, for their obvious ultra low loss. It's not zero at uh, below the transition temperature, and certainly at, at, at microwave frequencies, but it's it's very very low. Uh, the surrounding dielectric of those uh, structures, also uh, with its loss tangent and associated loss, is equally important. Sometimes those losses are comparable or or more than the, than the superconducting loss. In terms of impedance matching, the approaches that we take are, are very similar to what you would do for non-superconducting, but uh, there's this in kinetic inductance parameter that needs to be taken into account. Uh, and in these thin film structures, you don't necessarily know what that is. So there's a lot of tweaking and calibration uh, of, of those processes to, to be able to get to those values. Uh, it, we can still use traditional EM simulators, if you will, uh, like such as HFSS, Sonnet, ADS, et cetera as long as you use a, a good superconducting model for those uh, for those materials. Uh, and, and just some further motivation here, uh, just looking at what what would be possible here in the not too distant future. Uh, and again, this isn't this isn't something that I'll show today. It's just for motiv motivating the topic here. You can imagine a single layer or single ended strip line with five micron thick polyimid, five micron wide traces, etc. You'd be looking at 200 or so single-ended traces per centimeter of width. That's nice high density compared to what we saw in those previous coaxial cable approaches. And the thermal load on that may be something along the lines of 10 nanowatts uh, for connecting between the 4K stage and the 10 millikelvin stage. Something along those lines. Not exact numbers, but just something to motivate this. Uh, other things you have to take into consideration here need sufficient grounding between those signals in order to control your crosstalk. We need excellent impedance matching, and I'll show some results of why that impeding, impedance matching is, is very important, up to quite high frequency. One of the challenges that we're working on, and I'll show some, some details of that today, is, is breaking these out into connectors. Uh, there's not a good superconducting connector available off the shelf right now, so we're working on, on making uh, suitable structures for that. Uh, and then I mentioned this was a single layer, and of course you could expand this to multi-layer, have 2D breakouts, et cetera. So you could imagine this moving in a, into a very, very high density uh, interconnect kind of uh, space. So we weren't necessarily the first people to work on this. Uh, there was some work back in uh, 2013 by the Van Weers group, looking at some DC traces on polyimid. Uh, there's the, the Mason group and, and Miguel Dahl and those folks who are working on nebium tie laminated to Kapton, uh, some nice long cables since they're dealing with, with Kapton. Loss, you're still getting loss in the 2 to 3 dB. Uh, in this case, they're showing uh, crosstalk here uh, upwards of, of 25 dB. This is, the, this is crosstalk shown down here in this trace. Uh, but you can see there's, there's, a, there's a, a lot of promise. The, the wiggles I'll, I'll talk more about in, uh, in a little bit of detail. You can see some of the construction here, the, the caps on tape with the uh, with the nabium tie laminated to it, transitioning to these G3PO connectors. So there's a, just a handful of, of traces there connected per cable. Uh, that same group had another approach using coaxial, very small coaxial capillary tubes, uh, and you can see that that structure built here. So you know, nice, interesting. Structure, good performance over a, a wide range of, of temperatures, and and here they're they're quoting something along the order of 20 nanowatts uh, for 1k down to 90 millikelvin. So, and, that, and they're saying that's about half of what you could get with the smallest available coax. So, promising in terms of microwave performance, promising in terms of the thermal performance, and uh, that's that's something that we've been uh, been working on, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a lot more about that. An obvious question that comes up is what happens if you move to higher temperature superconductors? And so here's a couple of results. This was for magnesium diboride that was put onto flexible YSZ, which is a ceramic. Uh, and you can see they, they showed some, some nice, uh, nice transition temperatures of around 37 Kelvin for, for these devices. Um, and then in terms of, of YBCO, uh, there's an exfoliated process, exfoliation process to transfer that to to Kapton, and you can see 
Uh, here they've got their transition temperatures as well as insertion loss associated with that as you go from from room temperature down to about 18 Kelvin. You see nice drop off of that. And the looking structure here with the signal lines transferred to to the capped on as well. So uh, certainly interesting, and that was very recent. That was just a not not too long ago. So the, this this could should, could be very very promising, especially when you think about higher temperature stages. A lot of what I'll talk about is below. It's 4K and, and below because we're, we're dealing with the diabetes, as you'll see in just a, just a few minutes. Uh, so, so now I'll uh, stop the motivation segment and go on to the uh, packaging and interconnect and integration technology for graduate electronics. And specifically talk about, uh, about resonators. So a lot of the work that we've done is to determine what the parameters are for loss and uh, essentially the, comp the complex permittivity of the materials that we're, that we're using, specifically polyamory. And in order to do that, we use resonators. And resonators are, are pervasive about uh, out of uh, all of, of, of quantum systems. And, and uh, we're not necessarily using them in a quantum sense here, but we're using them to characterize our material. Uh, and we do microwave measurements on these, so S parameter measurements. Uh, to be able to extract out what our resonant peaks look like for this. In this particular case, I'm showing a three type resonator. So the signal will go all the way through this as opposed to say like a shunt type resonator where you would have a different response. So we get these peaks and those peaks correspond to uh, to the cues and we can relate the cues, the total cues or the, the, uh, the, the loaded cues to the conductor losses, the radiation losses, and then the dielectric loss, which we then use to pull out the loss tangent once we take into, effect, take into account the fill factor of the signal in, inside of the, the transmission line structure. So if it's a microstrip, microstrip, you can imagine all the fields aren't, aren't within the poly, polyamide or in, inside the dielectric. So we have to take that into account. If it's strip line, then uh, the, the Q factor there, the small Q is just, is just one. In general, you're, we're using very weakly coupled resonators with negligible radiation loss, and so our structures are dominated by the conductor Q as well as the dielectric Q. Uh, and we can relate the resonant frequencies to the to the real part of the permittivity as a function of, of frequency at the resonant positions, and we can uh, relate the imaginary part of that permittivity to the loss tangent. And so we can. Learn what we need to about the the polyamide to be able to to do the designs of our of our structures. Uh, pretty simple little half wave resonator structures with a coupling capacitor in here. You can see some of the parameters that we use for these structures. We look at we can also use this to to determine what our fabrication processes do to the niobium traces as well, to or to the superconducting traces as well. So. Doing subsequent fabrication processes on top of the on top of the niobium can change the properties of, of the niobium, and, and we can use the resonators and other structures to, to help us figure that out. Here's a, a representative fabrication process. In our older processes, we were using this chrome aluminum release layer, and then doing a multi-layer thin film process on top of that. Our polyamide layers are somewhere in the range of 10 to 20 microns and the niobium layers are around 250 nanometers. And so you can see the stack up here. We we can subsequently deposit polyamide not niobium and, and build this build the structure up. In terms of the the microstrip fabrication processes, uh, we would actually go ahead and, and just release this with by notically dissolving away the the aluminum layer. We would release this structure and then we could deposit a ground on the backside. And you can see what some of these structures look like here. Uh, I'll mention later on some of our more advanced fabrication processes. In terms of measurement setups, they're relatively straightforward. We can just either dump them in a bucket of liquid helium. So we mount the sample properly with connectors on a support board and then can just immerse that directly into the helium. Here you can see one's got, this has a little frost on it from where it was just recently pulled out. Uh, or we can go into a closed cycle cryostat uh, and, and measure as a function of temperature uh, inside of here. Again, properly connected with coax cables, et cetera. 
so the, 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 the measurement setups are not super complex for characterizing resonators or, or transmission lines. A little overview in terms of the, the, the types of resonators that we've, that we've looked at here at Auburn, going from different types of substrates with directly soldering connections to them, uh, transitions, tra transitioning to using some low loss rogers to try to feed these resonators, looking at, at what we would need to do to get good grounds across these structures. Um, and then once we've developed our release process, we are able to release everything and then connect directly to these cryogenic, or sorry, to these edge launch connectors. These are Southwest microwave edge launch connectors. Uh, so we could connect the little pin from the coax right directly onto the, the cable itself and, and have it mounted to the support board. And that's, you can see, you can see these nice resonant peaks start to show up in that case. Um, and then a, a more advanced structure, multi-layer, um, long winding resonator here meandering across there uh, where the ground plane was done last. And you could see that that gave us even, even sharper peaks. And I'll, I'll dive down a little bit more into the details of that uh, as we move forward. So some of those uh, early resonators that we did, we were able to send out to some colleagues at, uh, at the University of Sydney and have them characterize these resonators down to uh, down to approximately 20 millikelvin. Uh, and you could see uh, a couple of interesting things. The resonant frequencies would shift. That's that's due to a continued uh, dropping of or a change of the kinetic inductance that causes the the shift of the of the resonant peak. And then you can see a, 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 the Q continued to sharpen as we went even lower. So that, that, that provides some uh, good evidence that, that these might be useful structures down even in, uh, in the, the millikelvin regime. Uh, one common way to plot this data is, is one over Q as a function of frequency, as you see in the bottom left here. And from that, this is essentially the, the loss of the system. And if you have a structure that's that's where we're looking at it as a function of temperature, then what's what's playing into into the, the, the situation here is that as you continue to reduce reduce that temperature, you have both a small loss in, a small reduction in loss due to the, the, the polyimide, but you also have a, a stronger superconducting state as you go into the, the lower temperature regime. And so your your losses continue to, to drop in that case. We did see some interesting uh, responses here as a function of, of power for these resonators. Uh, and you can see the different harmonics of, of this uh, resonator. And uh, as you continue to drop down in power, you saw, you could see the, the Q reduce a little bit. And so that's um, evidence of, of extra loss at low low powers or, or low photon count. And it's, it's uh, not unlike what you would see with two level systems and, and quantum systems. So some interesting things buried in the the in, in these structures if you really wanted to start looking at them from a from a, a quantum perspective. And I'll jump ahead here to uh, to, to the strip line. So what I've shown previously uh, up to this point was was microstrip. Uh, and along the way we've developed process a process to uh, to to build out full strip line in these structures. And so you can see the stack up here in the top right. Uh, I'll, I'll actually go into more detail when I talk about the strip line transmission lines. But building these structures out and, and, and fabricating them and, and characterizing them and seeing that we're getting cues uh, upwards of, you know, it's up into the, the 20,000 range, um, which from a quantum perspective where you're dealing with resonators of factor with a Q factor of a million or so, from a packaging and integration structure, this is still promising for uh, uh, for, for moving microwave signals around. Um, and you can see this is this this also shows some of the the, the details of, of different structures from from different uh, different batches and different wafers, and so it points to the uniformity of, of the of the process to, to some degree. I mean there's you know this is done in a university lab so uh, there are there are those constraints. Okay so jumping on to the interconnects, uh, the superconducting flex cables. One of the challenges that we face there is is how do you 
calibrate from a microwave perspective and, and put yourself in a position where you can be confident of the, of the measurement results when you're dealing with something that has very, very low loss. With, with the resonators, there's not as much calibration that needs to be taken into account with the, with the transmission lines since we're actually needing insertion loss values. Uh, we really need to do a good cal uh, calibration. So that's something that we worked on for, for quite a bit uh, to develop a set of standards. And we just use these Southwest microwave cables to be able, or uh, in, in launch structures to be able to, 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 to do that. So we can put in an insulator and have an open, have a short with a small piece of superconducting foil, or use this 50 ohm resistor. It's just a, a Viché resistor that has nice, nice properties all the way down to 4K. And so we can use those to do our, our calibration. Typically, we do short open load calibration, a short open load reciprocal through. And the reciprocal through can actually be your sample um, because of the way things uh, work, work out with that, as long as it is actually reciprocal. Uh, currently, we're, when we go through this process, we're still using multiple cooldowns to calibrate two ports. Um, sorry. Uh, if we move to RF switches, there's one cool down, but then you have to deal with those switches and the non-uniformity associated with those switches. So over the years, we've made a pretty wide array of, of different types of, of flex cables, different types of superconducting flex cables. And so you can see those are all listed out here, microstrip, an embedded microstrip, a strip line from a few centimeters up to a meter using Kapton and as well as the thin film processes that I mentioned earlier. Some of those are, are shown here. So you uh, can certainly make long spiraling structures on a, on a 150 millimeter wafer and, uh, and release that and, and have you uh, a, a nice one meter long strip line cable there. Uh, but a lot of the structures that we test are, are just meandered traces on this. So we can still get the length, but deal with the smaller more manageable test structure. So in terms of the fabrication process, uh, it's, it's quite similar to, to, to dealing with the, with the microstrip that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and it, in, in this case, I'm still showing the, the chrome aluminum release process. We can actually, we can build the whole thing on a few silica wafer and then use an eczema laser to, re to release this, this as well without having to use the chrome aluminum. Uh, so you can see in this case, we're using 4110. That's a photo imageable poly image so we can make nice uh, clean vias. In this case, we're electroplating uh, for the vias between the, the, the different layers. Um, aluminum, niobium aluminum is used for the signal layer. And we do a thin layer of aluminum before and after the navium. We're using aluminum, navium, aluminum because uh, that can help protect the, uh, the, the navium during the subsequent fabrication processes. So uh, for those of you that, that aren't aware, navium is sometimes forms kind of a columnar or porous type of structure. And uh, in, in that, case when you try to cure polyimid on top of it, there's the potential for some of those um, chemicals that come out of the, the, the curing process to get down into the niobium and, and cause the, the superconducting properties to be degraded or, um, or at least in, in some cases significantly degraded to the point where it's just not, not a superconductor anymore. If we use a thin layer of aluminum before and after that, then we found that we can cure the polyimid up to um, reasonably high temperatures and get good mechanical properties and good dielectric properties. Um, that was actually something we spent quite a bit of time on, looking at different barrier layers for, for those signal layers to be able to do the multi-layer process. So we, re we just repeat that process multiple times, build up our, uh, at the end, we end up with a ground layer, a signal layer, and then a top ground layer. And that, that gives us that uh, strip line configuration with connections down to the to the signal layer and uh, some un under bump metallization on top to be able to connect to to other other structures whether it's a connector or uh, or or do some of the face to face connection schemes that we've we've been working on more recently. So that's the strip line. Uh, oops. 
Am I still in control here? You're good to go, Mike. Okay. It jumped ahead a lot. I'm sorry. Okay. Let's see if it stays here. So, one thing to check out is the uh, the transition temperature of the signal trace, uh, as well as the ground traces after we do all all of that processing on the thin on the thin Navian. And so here you can see from multiple batches. We're looking at transition temperatures around 8.5, 8.6 or so uh, for the signal, as well as the same, similar for the for the ground. So this gave us confidence that uh, that we're we're leaving sufficient superconducting properties for the navium that it could still be used as a as a superconducting strip on. Uh, again, that aluminum protects that layer. Uh, we also cure the polyimide below 225 or at 225 C or below. And as I mentioned, we've also looked at aluminum oxide uh, deposited with ALD to protect that. that navigate. In that case, uh, we can actually drive it to even even higher cure temperatures. In terms of performance, um, showing in, in insertion loss on the left for one trace, uh, one superconducting transmission line, uh, strip line transmission line, and, and this is in, in uh, dB per centimeter. Uh, and this was calibrated on to the cable itself um, and you can see we're this is very very low law so on the right we're it's, it's roughly uh we're saying we're down, we're down below 0.1 db per centimeter and that's up to 14 gigahertz uh, in this case the the strip line was 25 centimeters uh, and I mentioned here that we have a, a 100 mi micron wide anti pattern need that just to help with some impedance mismatch. And that's actually where these these small wiggles come from. With such low loss, it doesn't take much of an impedance mismatch to cause uh, these these little oscillations. It, at each end of the line, you basically build up a, a, a bit of a resonator just because of that tiny, tiny uh, mismatch combined with the, the tiny loss. Um, and on the right here, we see uh, sampling across multiple wafers and multiple samples. And so it's a little, little bit of variation, but we're still down below that, that 0.1 dB per centimeter. Uh, and in the microwave world, that's, that's, just, that's just fantastic. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to be super confident of your calibration down to, to that level of, of loss. Uh, we did do a little bit of modeling to, to to verify that that small amount of mismatch is contributing to those wiggles. Uh, and, and so on, on the top here, you can see this little green dashed line. That, that's kind of the top envelope of those traces where that's when you're you know, basically matched well and your signal makes it through. You don't have a, a resonance at that point. So that's more like the actual performance if you were to get uh, essentially perfect matching for these structures. Another really important aspect of, of, the, uh, of the transmission lines, especially when you're talking about dealing with a densely integrated system here, is, is crosstalk. So how does one trace talk to another trace in these structures? So the, the test structure we use for that is shown here. And is a top ground, there is a top ground, so you can't see the actual traces, but they come off along this way. And then there's over the significant, over a significant portion of the length of the sample, they're in close proximity t together. They're approximately 100 microns apart. So they're, they're very dense in this structure uh, and, and, and closely coupled, if you will, or would be if there was significant crosstalk. But in these structures, we've, we found that we're, we're below 60 dB of, of crosstalk. There's simulation and measurement shown here. Uh, and S, S13 is the, the near end crosstalk and S41 is the, the far end crosstalk. And you can see both of those are somewhere in the ballpark of the simulation that, that we did for this structure as well. So nice low crosstalk structures. Uh, I mentioned earlier about using uh, ALD deposited aluminum oxide as a barrier layer. Uh, so, so this was just to, just to point out that, that that's something else that, that has been explored to look at the ability to uh, to cure polyimide on top of niobium with or without these barrier layers or pushing to higher temperatures. So, for example, if we didn't use a barrier layer and we tried to cure that polyimide at the recommended 375 degrees C, it would completely completely kill the niobium superconductivity factors. Whereas 
uh, for some of these other samples, you can see going to these higher temperatures, we still were left, even though there's a small amount of degradation in the TC and, and IC, we're still left with significant um, superconducting properties for these, uh, for these structures. So a, a, a lot of, let's see, if I go back here, you can see we're still using edge launches in, in these samples, uh, but not, that's not really the route to a high density of, of interconnections. So uh, we've moved to an Indian bump process, just showing how that looks here for the plated bumps here and, the, and then reflowed. And then you can see um, this is what one of the more recent versions of the cables looks like, depending on some curing uh, approaches. Sometimes if we don't do it right or we use the wrong stack up, we get some curling of the polyamide, but if we do it right, we can get nice, nice flat uh, polyamide. And here it's attached to a small chip that might the image of that would look like this looking looking through the the top of the tape you can see the bumps nice nice and smashed and lined up nicely and on the other end we've, we've got it connected to a, a commercially available uh, connector uh, so on one side that's an indium indium bump on the other side the, these these connectors come with uh, with with sac uh, balls on them so we can we've connected those directly to that and it's not not a super concern in terms of the metallurgy there, because we're going to uh, to low temperatures. Some more images here, uh, specifically pointing out some of the underfill uh, approaches. So, and we've developed these approaches to be able to get the right amount of, of underfill inside of these structures, get decent fill around the edges and in these dense, densely bumped areas, and that really helps stabilize things from a mechanical perspective. Uh, to to test these structures when you've got indium bumps, that's a that's a challenge. Uh, and so the approach we've taken is we we connect it to a small test chip, and we can test it that way, at least from a DC perspective, and then just cut that chip off, leaving behind a small bump array uh, that you could use as your functional bump array. And then if in our case we have these little little openings in the PI in the polyimide, and we can either laser uh, remove those or use just a small DC arc to essentially vaporize the, the traces of that in that, that space. And then you're not left with a big stub hanging off of here that, that might potentially uh, cause problems with your microwave performance of the structure. And you can see that the tape sitting here in its measurement fixture uh, as well. Okay, so on to cable-to-cable uh, -cable connectors. Uh, Here's a, an early approach uh, where we were using this, what we're calling, what we call a, a bridging approach. So you have these two cable pieces that are butted up against each other. And then you have a small connector with a, 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 or a connector with a small little trace that overlays the top of those to make basically a bridging structure from, from the micro, microstrip on one side to microstrip on the other side. And then a, a portion on the bottom, a grounded, uh, sorry, a, a metallized portion on the bottom that can, completes the, the ground. And so here you can see a 3D blow up view of it. Here is a structure cabled up and ready for testing. Uh, in, in this case, the student that did this decided to measure this in an intact method and then cut the exact same cable and do the, uh, the connector uh, attachment process to use the exact same structures for before and after to see how, see what the impact was of, of that connection approach. And we also used a little bit of a uh, little bit of modeling here in in ADS, uh, where we could model the intact structure as well as add in a small uh, a small. It looks like there's a lot of parameters here, but there's really just two or three that are are important listed down here. Uh, we can we were able to get some modeling that uh, some simulations that that were an impeccable fit to the data. So here we see um, a a measured reconnected structure and then if we had this uh, non-ideal launch that that was part of the the launch structure here on the cable that would cause these resonances in in the in the structure once it was remeasured uh, and then if we just removed that part and looked at the intrinsic part of the of the the loss associated with this we get this this reconnected with the uh, with an ideal launch and we see that in these structures uh, even with the connector, we were still getting about 0.18 dB for the for the whole entire structure. Uh, and so, 
folks who are interested or who have seen or are more familiar with time domain plots, uh, you can see here on the right, we've also got uh, we, we've also got uh, time domain traces for this, and you can see the uh, the end SMA is, and then the intact version is is the red one, so it doesn't have the bridging connector capacitance. And then uh, when we added on the little capacitance associated with this uh, this structure, you can see the little dip right in the middle. Uh, so still successfully using you know. Uh, this gave us some promise that, that, that this wasn't a bad approach uh, uh, to be able to, to get cables to, uh, to communicate to each other. Uh, and so later versions have, have looked a little bit more uh, in those details. I'll talk about that in just a minute. Some other important aspects of this, though, are the, the thermal cycle reliability, right? If you're going to use these over and over again, how do they behave when you, when you, when you thermal cycle them? So here's some results showing, uh, even though it does have this, you know, complex structure, which I hope makes sense now that I've described it, you can see that after we've cycled this several times, five in this case, uh, going from, from 4K up to room temperature and back down, uh, you can see we get quite good uh, thermal cycle reliability. And then I, I didn't include the, the results because they look very similar. But if we were to take it apart and reassemble it, our results look very similar to this as well about the same amount of, of variation from disassembly and reassembly. So all, all of these uh, were, were, were quite promising for, uh, for this bridging connector approach. <clears throat> the next version uh, that we did for that, we tried to get a little, get a little fancy and have these extra little uh, pieces that, were, that we hoped would be a little uh, more um, uh, uniform across the, the whole entire structure. Uh, and includes some self-alignment features to it, both for the tapes as well as the as, as the components of the connector. And you can see the little tape alignment features here. And all all, the, all of these were were precision fabbed with microfabrication techniques. So we get down into the tens of low, low tens of microns alignment there. Uh, but this consisted of several pieces of of the of the tape. This um, connector structure, and and in fact, this this is a full strip line. That was fabricated onto that that connector. So you can see the traces here, and the, uh, the the top ground. There's a bottom ground there as well that you don't see. This piece has some small little wells in it, and then there's a piece of polyimide that has copper uh, pillars on it. So those would reside over the top of these wells, and then the tapes sit on top of that. And those little copper pillars would then push on. Oops, push on the tape. Uh, up against the the location that it needed to to connect on the uh, on on the connector, uh, and so that was the that was the approach for our our, our second uh, connector structure. There, you can see it uh, here. It's it's uh, here's our our measurement setup in these boards where we have these two connect commercially available connectors that it's that everything is attached to and, and mounted in uh, in this in this uh, immersion probe. As well, uh, we didn't get to the point of doing microwave uh, tests on this uh, because we frankly jumped to another structure that I'll show in just a minute. Uh, but uh, we did see some promising results for this in terms of the the DC performance. So we saw the traces, um, the, the traces transition, and we could see their critical currents. Uh, so essentially, you see multiple critical currents here, uh, but uh, uh, that, that's associated with, with each of those, most likely each of these pieces, right? The, the traces as well as the, the, the small uh, superconducting portion on the, on the connector itself. Um, okay, so then on to the, 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 the most recent one, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, connections. I don't show a whole lot of, of details here. There's some, some abstracts out, outstanding, but I'm showing a, a little bit of, of hints here to hopefully get some interest. Uh, so in this case, Instead of the cables being abutted to each other, we're just they're just face to face. Uh, the signals are, are are facing each other, and uh, if we look at the DC properties of these, uh, you can see it's showing a TC of nine. It's niobium, so there must be a small little offset in in terms of the temperature there. Uh, resistance wise, uh, you can see that uh, in, in in this case we had six lines that were testable, so all six of those transitioned. 
as well, and you can see the, the critical current for each of these. Uh, and then we were able to do some, some higher frequency testing on this, again, in the time domain, um, where you, you see our, our 50 ohm input, and these were designed for, for 20 ohms, the, the, the tapes and the, uh, the connector structure. Uh, and there's a little bump right here that, that is where the connector is in this particular structure. And so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's relatively transparent. You can see all, all 12 lines for, the, for this particular case look, look good. And then if we cranked that through um, uh, a simulation model, you could see what the degradation was in, in terms of this, um, basically this is a, in a single flux quantum light pulse. So here's the input. And then once it came out of the whole entire thing, you can see it was degraded by about 30% in this particular case. But this is a very high frequency pulse, right? These are ten, tens of, of picoseconds here. Uh, so speaking of simulation, uh, I mentioned earlier that we do uh, that we did a lot with, with ADS. Uh, and so here's a, a, a model uh, that, that shows an 85 millimeter long strip line uh, along with that face-to-face -face connector that I, that I just described. And here's the input eye diagram, and here's the, the output eye diagram. So if you were looking at getting those um, SFQ-like pulses through, through this, uh, it, you would most likely be successful on that. So just some other considerations here. Uh, certainly there's a mechanical reliability. I mentioned a little bit about that. Repetitive flexing, cooling and flex configurations, a, a lot of things to consider there. Um, in terms of environmental stability, already talked about the barrier layers. There's also, in some cases, impact of humidity. Some of these structures were baked in a vacuum at 90 degrees C for two hours before we use them because polyimid can, can uptake water and water vapor. There's also thermal cycle reliability. One of the big challenges that we're fabricating these up at elevated temperatures and we're using or cycling down to and from 4K or, or even lower. So the thermal cycle reliability is, is certainly important. Uh, other considerations, not necessarily for the superconducting flex cables, but if you were doing something with photonics, there's other considerations like having fibers aligned properly and maintaining that alignment as you cool off as well. All, all the CTE types of things that uh, I'm, I'm sure people that are in the packaging society uh, would totally comprehend. Uh, some new packaging and integration technologies, things that uh, are on our radar, looking at alternative MCM substrates, as well as construction of those substrates for better CTE mis mismatch when you're looking at integrating more dye onto these substrates and then taking them down to 4K. And then uh, always looking for suitable materials for dye attach and underfill, specifically if you start to think about needing to do reworkability on these. Um, if you can imagine extending this to the superconducting quantum world where you might have an MCM full of qubits and one of those chips has problems and your others are your golden ones, you might want to be able to rework something. So reworkability is always a, something on, 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 uh, on, our, on our thought, on, on, our, on our minds. And then you, you can see the connector structures that we've been looking at so far. Uh, there's still room for improvement on, on those by all means. Okay, so I'll take the, the last few minutes here. Uh, I'll, tr I'll try to go just, as, you know, because we're bumping up against the end of the hour here and I think I've gone a little too slow, but I'll, uh, I'll just put out some comments and thoughts on, on moving everything towards quantum. Uh, so without describing every single thing on, on this slide, uh, the, the, the simple difference here between the classical and quantum information is if you're dealing with classical, you're looking at a switch that's on or off or a, a capacitor or a node that's charged with some particular V, uh, some particular voltage. And we look at that as, as that representing a zero or a one. In the quantum world, it's more of a linear algebra type of description where you have some basis states, zero and one, for example, and you can make a, uh, an, an overall vector associated with those. And, and so the, the state vector can have representations um, that, are, that are not zero or one, but are a combination of those. It can provide you superposition, can, can, can provide entanglement, and a, a 
better picture of a single qubit is this block sphere where if, you have, if these are your basis vectors 0 and 1, you can be anywhere on the surface of this sphere through various operations depending on the type of physical sy system that you're, that you're using. So that, that opens up a lot of possibilities for, uh, for processing information that is, that is quantum. Uh, if you will recall, uh, historically there were many different devices in the, in the classical world, specifically when we're looking at, at, at CMOS, um, there was kind of slow growth until the materials were settled on, right? You had silicon versus a lot of other semiconductors. We needed clean silicon dioxide, but once that happened, there was this exponential growth uh, that's still, you know, arguably continuing, depending on, on your model that you're looking at. Uh, and there are continued materials that will support that growth. There's actually, uh, I feel like there's a similarity now where uh, in the quantum world, there has been historically a, a lot of different technologies and materials that are being explored. And, uh, and, and that's continuing to go on, whether it's photonic or, or superconducting, et cetera. Uh, but the hope here is that once we can get, our, get a handle on these clean materials, but looking at it from the perspective of a quantum clean material, that we could see that sustained growth maybe going to, to exponential. Uh, but I, I think there's probably a, a tremendous number of material studies and advances that are actually needed for that. Uh, you've probably all seen this before, but different types of, of qubits, the superconducting microwave type structures from Google and IBM, trapped ions from places like IonQ, uh, and photonic optical types of systems such as a Cyquana, uh, Cyquana. And, and, and that's just a, just a few of the possibilities. Uh, the challenges here are that these quantum states are usually pretty delicate, especially if you're talking about the superconducting structures that I'll, I'll, I'll describe in a little bit more uh, in just a, just a minute. But we need to preserve that, that coherence of that, of that quantum state to be able to maintain the superposition and entanglement and propagate that through the, through the network or through the system to be able to uh, really harness all of the power of, of quantum operations. Uh, and specifically, those are generally these unitary operations to manipulate and, and interact those qubits. Uh, systems that are uh, easier to control, if you will, uh, tend to decohere a little faster. And so there's a trade-off between the control and the, and the coherence. Uh, and I, I mentioned earlier the, the block sphere. You can imagine instead of that being just a single point on the block sphere, that that noise, if it encroaches into the system, it starts to uh, to destroy that quantum information and spread spread out or smear the location on that block sphere. It's not as high of a fidelity qubit or operation anymore, and uh, and, and basically destroys your your ability to, to process that quantum information. And so. From a materials perspective, I kind of think of this as, as, a, as the situation that I described earlier with these resonators, where you have these different loss mechanisms that all sum as their, inverse, as their inverses, and the overall Q is dominated by that lowest Q process. You, some, sometimes when I'm describing it to my st students, I describe it as a bucket with water and holes in it, and you can imagine that analogy as well. We want to figure out where those holes are and what the loss process are so that we can uh, reduce those leaks, um, not totally eliminate them, you know, likely not totally eliminate them, but, but get them low enough to where this quantum error connect correction protocol can, uh, can take over. And at that point, then you can start to realize significant scaling. Okay, so I chart here, um, apologies for all the, all the words, but some thoughts about where this quantum packaging and integration system situation is right now. So up till now, this could also be past, present, and future, I think. Uh, so we're dealing with systems that are less than 100 qubits, they're integrated onto one chip, and they're in one package. Uh, a lot of different types of operational uh, quantum systems, uh, but, they're, but they're small. We're moving into this NISC era, which was described by, by Preskill for noisy intermediate scale quantum, somewhere around 100 plus, I mean, these are rough numbers here, but most likely these will still be integrated onto one, onto one chip or into one package. Uh, you, you saw earlier this, the description with Intel uh, bringing some of their control electronics down into those systems. So I think we'll see a lot more of that. And, um, uh, and then if you think about moving the quantum information around, we'll, we will need things like quantum state transduction to be able to noisily move those, that info between the, the systems. 
Uh, but, but the situation here is that we have this opportunity to really deeply explore the packaging integration materials, the structures, uh, to be able to, to interconnect everything and learn about the impact of these materials on the, the quantumness of, of the system. There's a new article out just, just recently in science uh, that's listed down here that, that describes a lot of a, a lot of this situation. And in one sense, you could use the qubits themselves to sense those those defects. Uh, and then in a uh, it, it, moving forward from here, this post NISC area, if you will, moving to upwards of of a million or more uh, qubits, and, and not necessarily on on a, the same ship or in the same package. And so then you start to think about moving that that quantum information around and needing quantum capable and transparent interfaces. So by all means, we have to understand how these materials interfaces affect that the, the decoherence of these quantum systems, so that we can remove and control those effects again, so that the quantum error correction can be performed. Uh, Getting closer to the end here, so hopefully I'm not rushing too fast. Uh, I want to leave a few minutes for, for, for questions. Uh, but to put some things into scale for uh, for superconducting qubits, a five gigahertz photon, we're dealing with something like 20 microelectron volts. And this is why we need to push it down to 10 millicolons, because uh, at, at, at room temperature, or even at 4K, your background thermal noise is just, it just overwhelms this, this, this system. And, and once you get down to about 10 millikelvin, about 0.9 micro dB, or if you're familiar with the power, it's around minus 220 dB m per hertz. So nice low background to, to be able to, to keep your qubits where you want them. Um, there's a, a, a talk that was given last week by Joe Barton, who's at Google, and he mentioned uh, potentially millions of interconnects with high density to be able to control these systems. I mean, you see earlier with that Google system where they're at now, uh, and, and that's just for, for 50 -ish or so qubits, um, 50 to be exact. So expanding that to millions of qubits is, um, is, is daunting nonetheless. The other challenges here, these systems are not necessarily 50 ohms. You don't want any reflections. Uh, you need to control crosstalk and scattering. And by scattering, I'm talking about resonances or modes that are in the packages that these exist in. And, and I, I won't step on Robbie's feet because I think he's, well, as we saw, he's going to give a talk here in a few, few weeks. I'm sure he'll talk a lot about that aspect. You need the high thermal isolation, reduced thermal load, thermalization, attenuation. Uh, there's certainly uh, the, the reliability and stability as, as well. Um, and then there's this need to eliminate the loss into unknown or unclear processes. Specifically, what I'm talking about there are these things that, that look like two-level systems such as the, what you might find from surface oxidation or the interface states. And, and so it turns into a situation where it's really difficult to, to passivate these, these systems out. Uh, so we mentioned this earlier of seeing that at low, low photon count or low, low photon or low microwave powers. And there's a handful of papers out there over the past several years with very similar situations uh, of, of seeing, you know, th these are done at, down at, at very, you know, low temperatures with, with very clean and much higher Q structures, uh, but you're still seeing this in some of the similar packaging materials uh, at, at, at these temperatures as well. So for these, these low photon count um, systems where, where your, your two level systems are not saturated and so they, they can absorb uh, that when you have low, low photons, low number of photons. So, so just trying to make the connection there between this packaging and integration and cabling world and and, um, and things that are happening in, in, in the quantum world, I'm not necessarily saying we make polyemic qubits. Hopefully that's not the message that's being being taken. So, and again, I'm not going to step on, on Robbie's toes. I think he'll talk a lot about this, uh, but the packaging and area aspect and integration aspect for quantum systems is, is rapidly growing. I mean, you can see that the Tangle Lake processor here with 108 RF connections to control 49 processors, or 49 qubits. Uh, in this, the control wiring is, is much greater than one in terms of controlling the, the qubits here. Different types of interconnect structures and 3D packages that I think folks will learn about here in a, in a, in a couple of weeks. Okay, all right, so, um, so I went over there, hopefully got to, to show you a, a, a good uh, look at, at some of the things we've been looking at uh, in terms of the package integration for, for cryogenic electronics. 
talked about the resonators for materials exploration, the different cables and connectors that we're looking at, and then uh, try to give a, a quick overview and make some connections to the, the quantum side of, of what's, uh, what's, what's happening in the packaging and integration world. So with that, I'll just uh, say thank you for everything and uh, happy to entertain, entertain questions. All right, uh, uh, so we, we got a bunch of questions that are unmuted yet. Uh, the first one is from Paul Kim. Let me see if, uh, go ahead, Paul, okay. ask uh, the questions. Okay, very nice to meet you. Uh, I'm from Dupont and quite interested in these uh, new uh, applications. And then, you know, they are from material point of view, it, I really would like to know what is the, you know, critical uh, you know, the property. Is it, uh, for example, CT or low, D, low DK or low DF kind of stuff? Uh, so that you know, the, this kind of uh, packaging material or limit or underfill kind of stuff uh, being utilized for, in superconductor material, but eventually for quantum computers systems. That's what I'd like to know most. Okay, sure. Yeah, ho hopefully I can shed a little bit of light on that. Good, good question. Thank you. Um, so I think it, it, it's really all, everything that you that you that you mentioned there uh, from the microwave side of things. We're, we want as low of a loss as, as we can possibly get. Uh, so, so the the the, the actual uh, permittivity is, is. I mean, you can design around that, but the loss is really the the key factor there. Uh, but we're aware of very low loss materials that don't have the mechanical and thermal properties to make it to make it flexible. For example, it becomes brittle at, at low temperatures, and so that that's a challenge there. And um, I think it's I think there's a lot of opportunities to to design some new dielectrics that that uh, uh, that, that have those you know fabricatable multi layer thin film process uh, capable uh, approaches, but still um, you know has the, the lower loss. Properties. So you could see we're, 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 we've got queues that are around 20 to 40,000 and comparing that to say like the qubit technology, you're looking at queues of over easily over a million in the superconducting world. So again, not saying we have to, to make polyimid or you know, flexible qubits, but if we ever wanted to move quantum information across those interfaces, uh, with cables like what we've talked about here, we, we really need to understand what those losses are and where they come from in the materials. I see. So you are saying that at the same time, you know, the uh, fabric couple and then, you know, the, but at the same time, mechanical and thermally reliable, but at the same time, low loss, right? <laughs> Which is a dream material, but, you know, the, yeah. Uh, you know, I'm really interested in to, you know, the devote uh, to this area. So, you can check my email. Please let me know in detail. We can discuss you know, the further later. In sure. The Mike, uh, Paul, Paul Nuttall also asked, uh, why did you choose polyimid? Are there other properties you would optimize? Are there other materials that might possibly be coming along? Why did we choose polyimid? So it, there was a little history here in terms of uh, let's let's try these. There was another material we tried called ALX uh, by Asahi Glass that was a really low loss interlayer dielectric. Um, I think in terms of, we didn't necessarily pick PI, we, we tried, we, or polyamide, we tried polyamide and it, and it worked for what we wanted to do at that time. Um, it's always been on the radar to look out at, uh, at, at other materials. Um, you know, there's, there's, um, there's things like BCB and, and, and those other those other types of materials as well. So I think it's a, a, a ripe field for exploration to see how these behave from a, a microwave perspective as in a, in a mechanical thermal perspective at low temperatures. Okay. Uh, now Yu Tao Yang has a has a uh, question for you. I've unmuted you, Yu Tao. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Professor Michael, it's great to hear your talk. So I have two questions. So first one. Uh, so in the simulation you just show in the ADS, right? So I know in ADS there might may not be any. Uh, so how do you make sure it's superconducting uh, properly? In ADS, what we're using here is a is an S parameter block that takes into account the S parameters of the superconducting transmission line. Is that is that what you're referring to? Yeah, we're we're not. So this is a simulation simulation using S parameters that we got from 
measuring our own structures or, or simulating our own structures. And so you can simulate an HFSS, build an S parameter model, or you know, extract that, the S parameters for that, and then put it into, into ADS. Right. So, so in, let's say in the material library, right? Let's say if we use Niobian, then uh, I think uh, in the library, there's no, let's say the, the resistivity in the superconducting state of Niobian, it's not in the library. So you right. measure these and input into library and do the material selection, right, by yourself. Yeah, yeah, so so actually there's, um, let me see, I, I even had, I, I ran across it, I, I'm not gonna look for it, that's rude, it, it was on my desk. So so ANSYS has a, has some, you, you can find it by, by searching the, the web, I believe. It, it, there's some input from ANSYS on how to model superconductors in HFFS. And you, and you can fold in, you know, kinetic inductance and, TC and things like that. Oh, I see. So, so yeah, so, so you can you can build a a quite good superconductor model in HFSS, and then use that to if you know if you didn't have something to, to measure. Sometimes we just measure and just put those S parameters into ADS as an S parameter block. But otherwise, you can you can do that in um, HFSS or or Sonnet and, and get the S parameters for how. The superconductor will actually behave. The superconductor plus the dielectric. Remember, the dielectric is just as important. I see. So, uh, so uh, the second question is that. So I noticed that you use uh, titanium layer as an addition layer on niobium, right? So for this fifteen nanometer of titanium, do you observe any delamination? So, so it it turns out actually that niobium is. A pretty good adhesion layer in and of itself, um, right? So it, it's 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 a refractory metal, just like just like titanium. And so you know, ti, niobium, uh, tungsten, they're they're all pretty good at adhesion layers. Um, we, we we did do a lot of work on those barrier layers. So some of the best results we had were uh, were with aluminum. And so if we did aluminum, niobium, aluminum, and then cured polyimide on top of that. I could imagine it's hard to it's hard to figure this out, but I could imagine that that aluminum has just converted to aluminum oxide, and then it protects that niobium. Right? It's not a nice dielectric. Whereas um, with the with the aluminum oxide barrier layers, you're just getting aluminum oxide to begin with. I'm not quite sure I, I answered your question. We actually didn't do a whole lot with tie. Right. So, so with titanium addition, right? So what's the smallest pattern you have used it's 20 micrometer that you show in the slide or even smaller uh oh yeah right so so, so er, yes so so around 20 20 nanometers of titanium oh you mean 20 micrometer pattern nanometers are you talking oh, yeah. about talking uh, about I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, asking the dimension of the pattern the width of the wire or the, the Oh, yeah. okay. I mean, the smallest. It's pattern. something that's in the 20, nan 20 micron micrometer right. width was typically what the widths of our microstrip and, and strip line structures did. Let oh. me ask uh, Ofer Naman if he would like to ask his question about the fabrication. Yes, hi. Uh, this is Ofer Naman from uh, Can you hear me? Uh, my question is, uh, you make the flex on silicone and then you release it and what you end up is this like slinky of like, you know, flex wiring. So how do you, what do you do to un sort of unroll and straighten it to make it useful in, in actual wiring setup? Well, I don't know, can you see that? If you do it right, it's not, if, if you manage the, the film stresses, it doesn't curl up. So in combining slides, I, I, I kind of cut out some details. So there's a process where we fabricate it on silicon with a chrome aluminum layer, and then we can release it that way. But we're still doing polyimide and all that stack up on top of that. Or we can do it on fused silica, build everything up and use an excimer laser to, to release that too. But either way, we've got basically the same stack up or the, the same approaches to build up that, to build that stack up. And then if you manage this, the temperatures that you're curing everything and the density of your metals and 
designs design parameters like like that, then you can once you release it, it's it's not as curled. But but you point out a very significant issue is that when you do fabricate it, I mean in general it's going to be curled. You've got to balance the the fabrication processes and and things like metal density. Okay, so so if you so what you're describing is you know sort of limited by the diameter of the wafer that you fabricate it on. Uh, but if you want to make longer stuff, like you know you have to do some spirals or go to larger format, and so what's up with that? Sure, you could get away with spirals. Uh, we're currently limited here in terms of our you know fab at a, a university lab with with 150 millimeter uh, diameter substrates. Um, but there's, if, if you, uh, flat panel displays are, are, are fabricated on huge, huge pieces of, of glass, right? So there's the potential there to scale that up to about whatever size you wanted to, if you had the right fab resources. Okay, thank you. Okay, Lou, I think that's all I have. Uh, do you have some um, No, there, there's one more uh, from uh, Suhil Nadri. Go ahead and ask it. He's, he logged off, but you can ask the question. Uh, okay, he had some questions okay. on the MCM substrate. Okay. Okay, no, it's a kind of generic here. Yeah, I think he, he had to ask. It. Uh, okay, one. Okay, there's one question here. Hang on, there's one question here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, so that was um, something that I, I'll have to, not inviting myself back, but it's just it's something for a future day. I, I was pointing it out as there's an, MC, the MCM aspect is, is just as important as the flexible interconnect. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. Hey, uh, Mike. Also, one question here. Yeah. Uh, what speed of uh, signal propagation is possible with uh, SC transmission lines, and how does that compare with uh, non-SC lines? Oh, uh, it, it's going to be about the same. Uh, you, you've got uh, you, you've got the it, it's a it's more on the loss side that you're gaining, but you still have L and C. In a in a transmission line geometry, um, I, if you go with a high kinetic inductance material and that becomes your dominant L, then which most likely in the size of the structures that we're talking about here, that's not going to happen. So it's it's essentially very similar. I mean, the the polyimide uh, permittivity is around three point two, so. It would be similar to the to the speed of propagation for. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you, you don't you don't necessarily get any speed advantages. You get loss advantages. Okay. And, and longer distance transmission. Yeah. Okay. Hey, I have one more question for you, Mike. It's getting late here. Yeah. Yeah, uh, no. Do you know of any um, database for material properties at Cryo? You know, for people working in this area, you know, they need to. Uh, properties for simulation, things like that. Uh, it's uh, really hard to find. It is hard to find. I know NASA. So, so there's a couple of issues there. So NASA has a ton of information because of all their cryo situations. Um, the problem that we've always run up against is, well, what if I want to know it at 40 gigahertz or something like that, right? I mean, it's it's so there's. There's, can you find that information? Yeah, but is it really exactly what you need? And then on top of that, there's there's all the fab aspect, right? I mean, we're curing polyimide at, in some cases at 225 instead of 375. So just because it says polyimide, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the polyimide that you care about. So we often have to um, to characterize our own our own property. I mean, that, that, that's part of what my early early part of the, uh, the talk was about was that uh, using those resonators, we can characterize the materials and structures the way that we need to characterize them for the specifics of the structures that we're trying to make. 
Now, that being said, there are databases. I can't remember off the top of my head. I'd have to go online and look it up, but there are some materials databases out there that have some useful information. One more okay. question from New Tao. Yeah, so, yeah, Professor Banco. So I have one last question about the YBCO wires, um, flexible substrate that you show on your slide. Okay. So, uh, uh, so is there any? So do you do more uh, YBCO thing on the flexible substrate? It seems that you only do more, much more thing, most of the thing on the niobium um, flexible. So just to be clear, the YBCO was another another group. They're up at at Brookhaven, I think, and um, so so that. Uh, while I would love to be doing some higher high temperature superconductor work here, we will, you know, we just don't have the the resources at this at this point. That that's somebody else's work. I think there's a company that does the exfoliation process. Okay, so okay, I see. So yeah, that that's that that was a uh, that that was just introductory material to, sh to say what else is out there, because uh, because other folks are working on this stuff as well. Okay, move out to you. I see. Yeah. Okay. One question, Mike. Uh, somebody asked. Uh, that person is not on on the online anymore. But uh, uh, she asked, uh, aluminum oxide. You mentioned that that tends to crack uh, if it experiences large thermal cycles. And so the question is, uh, is that a reliability concern for interconnects uh, that are used at low temperature? Um. Can I say it cracked? I don't know. I don't. Uh, we have not observed any issues with the with the aluminum oxide layers that we've been using. They're very thin. Uh, the, yeah, I, I hope, hope, hopefully that answers the, the question. We we, ha we just haven't observed any cracking of the of the aluminum oxide. Okay. Okay, I think that covers it, up, Paul. Very good. Well, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you, Lou, for setting all of this up. And Mike, we do appreciate this.